31. Night. James found Amy and Scargill sitting on Amy's bed smoking. Scargill looked like a geek. Spindly arms and legs, greasy black hair tied back in a ponytail. He wore a kitchen uniform from his job at Greenbrook. Oh, it stinks in here, James said, stepping in through the hole between the old and new parts of Kathy's hut. This is my little brother Ross, Amy said. He's a whiny little shit. (laughs) Oh, you're harsh, Courtney, Scargill said, laughing. James was hurt. They had to act like brother and sister, but he didn't see why she had to be nasty. He was also jealous. Scargill was getting to spend all his time with Amy. Why are you here, Ross? Amy asked. This is my room as well. James said. Scargill and me want privacy, so get what you came in for and sod off. Did you get a job? James asked. I'm an attendant at Greenbrook Spa, Amy said. Four days a week. James started rummaging through his stuff. What do you want, Ross? Amy asked. My mobile, James said. I was going to see how mum is. Take mine. It's charging up in the car. Thanks, Courtney. James said. James sat in the front seat of the Land Cruiser and made a call to Ewart Asker. Hey James, how's it going? Ewart asked. Not bad. Amy's pissing me off. She with Scargill? Permanently, James said. Well, that's her job, James. She's got to get as close to him as she can. She told him I was a whiny shit. Ewart cracked up. (laughs) <laughs> that gives Scargill a sign that she prefers him to her kid brother. She doesn't mean it. Scargill must be in heaven, James said. Scrawny little nerd and he's got Amy all over him. You've got a bit of a soft spot for Amy, don't you? Ewart asked. James's instinct was to deny it. A bit, he admitted. If I was older, I'd ask her out. How did you know? Ewart laughed. <laughs> oh, you get this glazed look in your eyes when she's in the room. James panicked. What? Uh, is it that obvious? I'm joking, James, Hewitt said. So how's Kathy? Seems okay now, James said. How did you get on with Sebastian and Clark Dunn? Bad, James said. They're weird kids. Tough looking and smelly. They talk to each other as if you're not even there. None of the other kids hang out with them much either. I'll keep trying, but don't force it. Any other news? I've got one good break, James said. I made friends with Gregory Evans, Bungle's son. I spent nearly an hour with them. Bungle gave me a book called No Logo to read. Good book, Hewitt said. Read it, go and see him, pretend you don't understand something and use it as an excuse to hang around. There's not much about Bungle on file, is there? James said. No. He's been seen with all the bad guys, but he's never been arrested. There are over a thousand people called Brian Evans in Britain. We don't know which one he is. We don't even know exactly how old he is or where he comes from. He sounds American, James said. He's got that twangy sound in his voice. I think they call them rubbernecks. What's a rubberneck? Like in the movies. Cowboy types. Kind of stupid. He sounds like one of those. Hewitt laughed. (laughs) You mean a redneck? That's it, James said. He sounds like a redneck. That's useful to know. I'll get the Yanks to see if they have anything on him. What we need is for you to get in Bungle's hut, take some pictures and have a rummage through any paperwork you can find. But don't take any risks to make it happen. If you're seen taking pictures for no good reason, it will blow your cover. Bungle said they might ask me to keep an eye on their little boy when they go out. That would be an ideal opportunity, especially if the kid falls asleep. Are you sure they'd trust someone your age to look after him? Bungle suggested it, James said. Don't sound too eager. They might think it's odd. Anything else? That's all I can think of, James said. Keep in touch, James, Hewitt said. It sounds like you're doing a grand job. Thanks. Bye, Hewitt. It was past 11, and people were still arriving. 
They came in groups of four and five, pulling booze, food and firewood out of cars. Portable CD players competed with didgeridoos, tom-toms and guitars. The crowd was mostly teenagers and twenty-somethings, students from Cardiff and kids from the local villages, with a few old hippies who had turned up every Friday since the year dot. James wandered. He felt awkward. Younger kids rushed around chasing and fighting, older ones drank beer and snogged. James didn't fit well with either group. He moved away from the party into the forest. He could hear bangs from a clearing in the distance. As James got closer, he worked out it was the sound of an air pistol. The kids were Sebastian and Clark Dunn. They were freaks. If James wasn't on a mission, he would have steered clear. But it was his job to make friends. He decided to have another go. Sebastian and Clark vanished before James reached the clearing. There was a bird on the ground, cooing loudly and struggling in the mud. It was hard to see what was wrong in the dark, but the bird was in a bad way. James crouched down. He wondered if he should bash the bird with a rock to put it out of its misery. Sebastian bolted out from the trees. He landed on top of James and tried to pin him, but James was too strong. James elbowed Sebastian in the stomach. Clark came out to help with the ambush. He was almost as tall as James and probably heavier. Clark bashed James over the head with a heavy torch. The brothers managed to get James under control. Clark pressed the torch head into James's eye and clicked the bulb on. Squeezing his eyelid tight didn't stop the light from burning his eye. James was worried. Hopefully they would just rough him up, but who knew how crazy these kids were? If James yelled, nobody would hear over all the noise from the party. Why are you following us, scum? Clark asked. I wasn't, James said. I just came this way. Clark grabbed a chunk of James's hair and tugged his head out of the mud. James felt Sebastian, who was sitting on his legs, shift his weight slightly. James kicked up both legs, hitting Sebastian in his back. Sebastian yelled out and tumbled off. Now his legs were free, James thrashed about and tried to release his arms, which were pinned to his sides by Clark's thighs. I'll knock you out, Clark said. Clark punched James in the head. James put all his strength into lifting his stomach off the ground, making space under himself to slide out his hands. He scrambled from under Clark and stood up. Clark ran at James. James realised that months of getting hammered by black belts at Cherub was about to pay off. Without the element of surprise, Sebastian and Clark didn't have a chance. James waited until Clark got close. He sidestepped, kicked Clark full force in the stomach, punched him in the mouth, and finished off stamping him behind the knee so he smacked into the ground. Sebastian looked angry, but didn't fancy joining in. Clark looked pleadingly at James from his knees, hoping his beating was finished. I don't want to hurt you, James said. Just say you quit. Clark scrambled up, gasping for air. He was hurt, but a smile came onto his face. I've batted kids heaps bigger than you, Clark said. Oh, where'd you learn to fight? James found a tissue in his pocket. He gave it to Clark to wipe the blood off his split lip. Self-defence classes, James said, back in London. Clark turned to his brother. They were serious punches, Sebastian. You have to put your whole body into it, James said. Starts at the hips. If you get the technique right, it's eight times harder than a normal punch. Let him hit you in the gut, Sebastian, Clark said. I bet you double over. I don't want to hit him, James said. Oh, we hit each other to keep tough, Clark said. If I hit him in the guts, he doesn't even flinch. Sebastian stood with his hands behind his back, ready to take a hit. I'll hit his shoulder, James said. Oh, you can hit me in the guts, Sebastian said. I can take it. In the arm first, James said. Then I'll do it in your guts, if you still want me to. Sebastian turned so his side was facing James. James didn't want to have to hit him in the stomach. He knew it could do serious damage. So he gave Sebastian his hardest shot in the arm. 
Sebastian stumbled sideways and screamed out in pain, clenching his upper arm with his hand. Clark was wetting himself laughing. <laughs> I told you it was hard, Clark said. Sebastian tried not to show the pain. James felt bad for hitting him so hard. All this time, the pigeon was still thrashing about in the mud. James looked at it. What happened to it? Shot it with the air pistol, Clark said. Wasn't dead, Sebastian said. So I cut one of its wings off with my pen knife. You guys are lunatics, James said, grimacing. Better hope the shot kills you, Clark grinned. If it doesn't, it's torture time. Can't you put the poor thing out of its misery? James said. If you want me to, Sebastian said. Sebastian walked towards the bird. It didn't have much life in it. Sebastian pressed his heel into the bird. It let out a final desperate noise as its bones were crushed. Sebastian had a big smile on his face. James realised he'd made friends with a couple of seriously twisted kids. Chapter 32 Girl Sebastian, Clark and James went to the main hut to feed. Guests had brought meat to barbecue, as well as the cold dishes laid out on a long table. Joshua Dunn was serving vegetable curry. James wasn't mad on curry, but it was good stuff after being out in the cold. They took the food outside to the bonfire. A few dozen people sat on waterproof sheets around the fire. Sebastian and Clark found fire and world and sat beside them. Hey, little psychos, Fire said. Hey, jailbirds, Clark said, referring to his cousin's spell in prison. Fire and World were non-identical twins, with plated hair and pierced eyebrows. World looked at James. He sounded drunk. Care to tell me what your sexy sister sees in our baby brother? James shrugged. She's not fussy. Snogs anything with a pulse. What was that? Amy said. James hadn't noticed her sitting a few metres away. All the duns laughed. Amy faced James off with her hands on her hips. James couldn't decide if she was angry or just messing. Nothing, James squirmed. I was just saying what a nice couple you and Scargill make. Amy crushed James with a hug that took his feet off the ground. That's really sweet of you, Ross, Amy said. Because after what I thought you said, I was going to kick all your teeth out. James finished his curry and wandered off on his own. He noticed a girl leaning against a tree, smoking. Long hair, baggy jeans. She was about James's age. Nice looking. He didn't remember her from any of the intelligence files. Hey, can I have a drag? James said, trying to sound cool. Sure the girl said. She passed James the cigarette. James had never tried one before and hoped he wasn't about to make an idiot of himself. He gave it a little suck. It burned his throat, but he managed not to cough. Not seen you here before, the girl said. I'm Ross, James said, staying with here with my aunt for a bit. Joanna, the girl said. I live in Crado. Haven't been there yet. James said. It's a dump. Two shops and a post office. Where are you from? London. I wish I was, Joanna said. You like it here? I'm always covered in mud. I want to go to bed, but there's a guy playing a guitar three metres from where I sleep. I wish I could go home, have a warm shower and see my mates. Joanna smiled. So why are you staying with your aunt? Long story. Parents getting divorced, mum freaking out, got expelled from school. So you're good looking and you're a rebel, Joanna said. James was glad it was quite dark because he felt himself blush. You want the last puff, Ross? Nah, I'm cool, James said. Joanna flicked the cigarette butt into the night. So, I paid you a compliment, Joanna said. Yeah? Joanna laughed. <laughs> So do I get one back? She asked. Oh, sure, James said. You're really, like, nice. Can't I get any better than nice? Beautiful, 
James said. You're beautiful. That's more like it, Joanna said. Want to kiss me? Um, okay, James said. James was nervous. He'd never had the courage to ask a girl out. Now he was about to kiss someone he'd known for three minutes. He pecked her on the cheek. Joanna shoved James against the tree and started kissing his face and neck. Her hand went in the back pocket of James's jeans. Then she jumped backwards. What did I do? James asked. He'd just started enjoying himself. Police car, Joanna said. Hide me somewhere. James saw a flashing blue light and a couple of cops getting out of a car a few hundred metres down the hill. Are you a runaway or something? James asked. Hide me first, questions later. James led Joanna up the hill. The policemen were heading in the same direction. They seemed friendly and stopped to chat with a couple of people. James undid the padlock on Kathy's hut and clambered inside. Joanna slammed the door behind her. What's going on? James asked. Peek outside, Joanna said. Tell me what the police are doing. James stepped up to the window. I can see only one of them, he said. He's talking to some guy. What's he saying? He's standing 20 metres away and it's dark. You expect me to read his lips? Wait. The guy he's talking to is pointing at this hut. Joanna sounded hysterical. Oh, I'm in so much trouble. Why? I'm supposed to be sleeping over at my friend's house, but we came up here instead. Where's your friend? James asked. She met up with her boyfriend and abandoned me. But why are the police out searching for you? The door of the hut came open, and a policeman shone his torch in Joanna's face. Hello, Daddy, Joanna said. You'd better get out here, young lady. I'm driving you home. And as for you, the policeman moved the beam of his torch so James's face lit up. I don't know what you and my daughter have been up to, but you'll stay away from her if you know what's good for you. James watched Joanna's dad take her to the police car. He didn't feel like going back outside. He lit the gas lamp, found his packet of Mars bars, and poured a glass of unrefrigerated milk. I hear you tried to jump Sergeant Ribble's daughter, Kathy said. She looked smashed. I met her five minutes before her dad turned up, James said. We had one little kiss. So you claim, stud, Kathy said. She pinched James's cheek and laughed. Nobody had done that to James since he was about five. It's nice having you kids here, Kathy said. Livens the place up. I thought you didn't want us, James said. It was a shock, but it gets dull here after 30 years. Why don't you move on? I might, after you two go, Kathy said. Cash in that monster car, travel for a bit. Don't know what after that. Maybe I'll try getting a flat and a job. I'm getting too old to keep scratching for a living around here. What kind of job? James asked. Kathy laughed. <laughs> oh, God knows. I don't suppose there's anyone queuing up to employ 50-year-old women who last had a job in 1971. What doing? James asked. I worked in the student union shop at my university. Met Michael Dunn there, married him a few years later, came here, had a little boy, got divorced. You have a son? James asked. Had a son, Kathy said. He died when he was three months old. Oh, I'm sorry, James said. Kathy looked upset. She dragged out a wicker hamper and found a photo album. She flicked to a picture of a newborn in a white crotchet hat. Harmony done, Kathy said. That's my only picture of him. Michael took it the day he was born. Seeing Kathy upset about her baby made James think about his mum. He felt a tear well up. He wanted to tell Kathy about his mum dying, but it would be breaking the rules of the mission. Kathy noticed James looked upset and put her arm around him. Well, there's no need to get upset, Ross. It happened a long time ago. Your whole life might have been different if he'd lived, James said. Maybe, Kathy said. You're a nice boy, Ross. 
or whatever your real name is. Thanks, James said. I don't think it's right, the government using kids. You two could get hurt. It's our choice, James said. Nobody forces us to do it. Courtney is using Scargill to get to Fire and Whirl, isn't she? James was impressed Kathy had worked it out. It seemed pointless to deny it. Yeah, he said. All the Dunn family have been good to me, even after I divorced Michael, Kathy said. But those two have always been different. They're definitely up to something. What makes you sure? James asked. I've known Fire and World since they were born. There's something not right about them. A shiver goes up me when they walk into a room. 7am Monday, James's travel alarm went off to wake him for school. Amy threw a pillow at him when he didn't turn it off. He stumbled out of bed, rubbing his face, and unpinned a corner of the sheet over the window to let in some light. Can't you leave it dark? Amy moaned from under her covers. I've got to go to school. James started putting on a sweatshirt and tracksuit bottoms. It's freezing, James said. It's warm under here, Amy said smugly. I don't have to get up for three hours. I can't believe you get out of school. It's not bloody fair. Amy giggled under her covers. <laughs> it's toasty at Greenbrook. The water in the jacuzzi is beautiful, and I get a hot shower before and after my shift. I'm filthy, James said. I'm going to get so much stick from the other kids going to school looking like this. Put clean clothes on and use some of my deodorant. I'm wearing clean stuff. I'll still be covered in mud three steps out the door. Where's your deodorant? Where's your deodorant? Down the end of my bed. Amy's deodorant was in a pink can with pictures of butterflies on it. James figured it was better smelling girly than stinking of B.O., so he gave himself a good blast. I'm glad I don't have to get up, Amy giggled. This bed is really comfortable. James noticed Amy's leg poking out and tickled the sole of her foot. She pulled her leg in and squealed. Oh, serves you right for teasing, James said. Amy flew out of bed, grabbed James around the waist and started tickling under his ribs. No, please, James giggled. James's leg buckled from laughing. His face was red and spit dribbled down his chin. Beg for mercy, weakling, Amy said. No way, James spluttered. James couldn't wiggle free. Amy unleashed another wave of tickles. Oh no, please. Okay, mercy. Stop. Mercy. I said mercy. Amy stopped. Kathy's head poked in from her part of the hut. Her hair was all tangled. What's going on? Kathy asked. Oh, tickling, James said, gasping for air. I thought you were dying or something. I was trying to sleep. I've got to go to school, James said. Do it quietly, Ross, Kathy said. I'm laying in all morning. Nice life for some, James said. Is there anything for my breakfast? Kathy thought for a second. There's cold curry. Or you could have the last one of your Mars bars. Great, James said. Amy had snuggled back into bed and was laughing under her sheets. It was a two kilometre walk to the school bus stop in Crado. A few older Fort Harmony kids showed James the way. Joanna was at the stop with some friends. James said hello, but she ignored him. The village kids wore smart, casual clothes. Fort Harmony kids were tramps in comparison. It was a half hour ride to school, stopping a few times to pick up more kids. James rested his face against the window and watched the sun rise over the passing countryside. Gwen Morgan's school looked better than James's old school in London. The modern classrooms were in single-storey clusters with covered walkways between them. The areas between buildings had flower beds and neatly trimmed grass with keep-off signs. When the bell rang, kids walked to registration. No shoving or fights breaking out. Even the boys' toilets were clean. 
James washed as much filth as he could off his face and hands before finding his class. He handed a note to his form teacher and found a desk. This is Ross, the teacher announced. Please make him feel welcome here at Gwen Morgan and help him find his way around. The kids all looked polite and well behaved. Nobody spoke to James. First lesson was science. James asked a kid if it was okay to sit next to him. The kid shrugged. The lesson was dull. They were halfway through a topic, but James was bright enough to pick up what had gone on before and was soon bored. It felt really different to Cherub, where all the kids were clever and the teachers kept you on your toes. He wrote neatly in his new exercise book and homework diary, but it seemed like a waste of time. He would only be here a few weeks. Between first and second lesson, a couple of kids in James's class called Stuart and Gareth gave him a shove. Wait till break time, hippie boy, one of them said. James wasn't worried. He'd be able to fight them off if they tried anything. He got another shove and a punch in the back from Gareth at the start of morning break. James knew he'd become a target if he looked soft, but he didn't want to end up rolling around the floor fighting on his first day so he punched Gareth in the face and ran off. He spent the rest of morning break wandering on his own, paranoid that everyone was staring at him like a freak. Gareth had a tissue plugged up his nose to stop it bleeding for the whole of third period. After lunch, James wanted to join the kids playing football on the all-weather pitches, but Gareth, Stuart and a couple of their pals were playing. James thought it was best to steer clear. He found a quiet spot at the back of the school, sat against the outside wall of a classroom and started doing his homework. James noticed a shadow over his science book and looked up. Gareth and Stuart were standing over him with six friends for backup. James was furious with himself for letting them get so close without noticing. You killed my nose, Harmony boy, Gareth said. I didn't ask for trouble, James said. Leave me alone. Gareth laughed. <laughs> oh, in your dreams. We hate all you Fort Harmony filth, Stuart said. They should send the police up there and set dogs on you. James reckoned he could have beaten any two of them, managed to get a few hits in, and escape against three or four. But eight against one? No chance. Stand up, hippie, Gareth said. If he stayed on the ground, he could roll in a ball and protect himself. Standing would only mean getting knocked back down. Get your ass up, Gareth repeated. Piss off, James said. Haven't got the guts to fight me on your own, have you? Gareth kicked James in the knee. A few of the others moved closer, so there were ten legs circling. James braced himself for pain. Kicks came fast. Luckily, there were so many legs flying, they used a lot of energy hitting each other. James tried to tuck his knees into his chest, but a trainer clamped his stomach to the floor. He kept his legs together to protect his balls and wrapped his arms over his face. The main beating lasted about a minute. A couple of the kids who weren't in the surrounding group gave some brutal kicks in the side to finish off. Better learn some respect, hippie, Gareth said. The gang walked off, mocking the way James was groaning in pain on the floor. James couldn't stop the tears forming, but he was determined not to cry out. His arms and legs were dead from the beating. James got his books into his backpack and stumbled a couple of metres, holding onto the wall before his knee gave out. He sat there until a teacher came to unlock his classroom. He tried to pretend he'd slipped and twisted his ankle, but the teacher could see James was hurting all over. The teacher put his arm around James and helped him hobble to the first aid room. Mr Crow, the deputy headmaster, came into the first aid room. James was sitting on the edge of a bed in his boxes, holding up a cup of orange squash. He had plasters on his legs and arms. Who did this to you, Ross? Crow asked. He was a small, friendly-sounding man with a Welsh accent. I don't know. James said. Were any of them in your class? No, James said. James thought it was best not to grass. The school wouldn't expel eight kids, 
they would only get suspended for a few days. Then all their mates and older brothers would be after James for grassing. His life would be hell. If he didn't grass and managed to make a few friends to back him up, things might be okay. Ross, I understand it's your instinct not to tell on your classmates, but this is your first day here and you have been seriously assaulted. That is not acceptable. We want to help you. I'll be okay, James said. It's no big deal. By home time, James could walk again. Sort of. He was led out of the first aid room before the bell, giving him a chance to get on the bus without being caught up with everyone else. Joanna climbed on and sat next to him. It was the first good thing that had happened to him all day. What happened to you? Joanna asked. What does it look like? James said angrily. I got the crap beaten out of me. Gareth Granger and Stuart Parkwood, Joanna said. How did you know? James asked. It's always them. They're not even tough. It's just they hang out in a big group and stick up for each other. I just hope they don't make it a regular thing, James said. You need a bath, Joanna said. No chance of that at Fort Harmony. Have one at my house if you want. What about your dad? Working till six. Then he usually goes for a drink. Your mum? Lives in Cardiff with my big brothers. Are they divorced? James asked. A few months ago. What happened after your dad caught you on Friday? Lost my pocket money. Grounded for a fortnight. Rough, James said. Joanna smiled. It's so stupid. My dad grounds me, but he's never home to stop me going out. Joanna's house was a little cottage on the edge of Crado, with frilly net curtains and ornaments everywhere. Joanna flicked on MTV. They ate cheese on toast and drank tea while James's bath ran. The soap made his cut sting, but the hot water soothed his pains, and it was nice feeling clean again. Joanna opened the bathroom door and tossed in a clean t-shirt and an old set of her brother's boxes. She cracked up when she saw James in the huge pair of shorts and a Puma t-shirt almost down to his knees. Joanna took him into her room. Lie on my bed. She peeled off all James's soggy plasters, wiped his cuts with disinfectant and stuck on new ones. James stared at Joanna's long hair and the curve of her back as she leant over him. She looked beautiful. James wanted to kiss her again, but Joanna was a year older and she'd mentioned a couple of previous boyfriends. He felt like he was in way over his head.